Usability testing is all about, like for me, exposing the problems and exposing what works really well yeah. for users and understanding why. Research is not really yeah. like that. It's like they're just different tools. It's like, it's like saying, is a hammer better than a screwdriver? It depends right. on the thing you're trying to find out. So one thing I get asked a lot about is people like the idea of research. They know it's important. It's like flossing. Everyone knows you should do it, but they know, don't know how. Um, how does someone start getting into doing research, like if they know next to nothing about it? If you're thinking about your product as you're sort of developing it at that stage of research, then it's just great to get people using it for the tasks that you're planning it for. So even if that's friends, family, even if that's people in the office, it's just great to get your uh, product exposed to people like that so that you can watch what happens. And in usability testing, we're really looking for the problems for people fall into and uh, what works well for them and why it works well for them. And so having anybody go through your product, uh, you will see those things as they, as they work through. Over time, you'd want to you know, start testing with a broader range of users um, and get out of those kind of biases that come in with friends and family. But to start off and gain confidence and start small, it's a great place to start. So when you talk about usability testing, is there anything, and the biases, um, is there anything specific that you're supposed to look for? So you've, you've designed your app, you've given it to your friends or family. Is there any like, um, I suppose like golden rules or things to look out for? Or is it not really work like that? Yeah, well, what you make sure you do is kind of set up the tasks that you want to um, be watching for. Um, so basically you have people go through the tasks and they speak out loud as they do it often, uh, depending on what you're testing for. And so you'll be identifying your sort of most critical user journeys usually and have them walk through that. And often it's something like some language you use, we call that content, you know, um, the words you've got on the button or where you've positioned something that just don't make sense for most other people. It totally made sense for you in your design work or your or, or development work, but it doesn't work for other people. And so you're looking for that and you've got them speaking out loud so you can really understand kind of why they're coming at things in certain ways. And that's the value of usability testing, you know, as opposed to looking at um, data from logs or something, you're really understanding the why of um, uh, why they, they get into certain situations where they can't move forward or, or certain flows work really, really well. I mean, is there like a scale of research? So like usability testing feels like it's like the midpoint of a product life. That's lifestyle. exactly it, yeah. Uh, but is there like a before and after? Because I know um, there's also the debates of uh, was it user groups that you have where you're asking questions or surveys. I mean, is, how would you say is like the cycle of doing research? Right. What was the first thing you rec would you recommend before even building the thing or maybe when you've got early stages? Yeah, so right at the beginning, we tend to do what we call foundational research. That's when we're really understanding the domain. We might use also, you know, secondary research and see what else other people have done. Yeah. Um, but we might also do foundational research. Often it involves more sort of field research techniques, going out to where people are doing that activity that you're interested in supporting in your product. Um, so field visits, doing observational work, um, contextual inquiry is a particular technique where you're with the person throughout their day and asking kind of questions as you go along to really understand why they do certain things in their environment. So that's the whole like foundational research stage. At some point you might want to understand sort of broad representations of data. Um, you might do um, survey work. I'd always recommend doing some sort of qualitative work to begin with, um, whether that's, you know, your contextual inquiry, your interviews. Um, so especially for surveys so that you've got the range of results that you would want to ask for a particular survey question. If you come back and you've asked this kind of close-ended question with different um, question answers um, next to it, but you've missed a couple of really significant things out, yeah. then you're, you're, there's, there's real problems with your survey. So doing that qualitative work to begin with is really, really helpful. And then um, you referred to, I think you were meaning probably focus groups. Yeah. But sometimes get a bad rap. And, yeah. um, so focus groups aren't used that much in user research. Um, occasionally I've used them and it's really been more for my benefit of finding out a domain. I kind of haven't used them for rigorous, you know, representative data. 
But um, conducting a focus group helps me understand, like, these are all the important topics that matter to people within this domain. Yeah. And then I can go forward and do my other techniques. So it's more about boosting your own knowledge rather than finding information out about... That's how I've used them, so... You have, like, this kind of always versus mentality in tech. But, I mean, do you think there is... Um, a better way of research, whether qualitative or quantitative, or are these? Is that like a pointless thing to be asking? That it's really about using those to just get a better understanding of the problem that you're trying to solve. So, is one better than the other in your opinion, or is that it doesn't really work like that? They're actually very complementary, and you need both. So, um, when it comes to the stage of doing usability testing, oftentimes we might, when we're really into sort of initial use of the product, or we've got it out there to to beta testers or we're, we've already launched and we're doing studies then, then you can collect logs data. Logs data is like really very, very useful. You can see where people are dropping off on a page, for example, and why they're not converting, for example. Um, but you can't necessarily always understand why. And so partnering that with usability testing is really valuable uh, so that we can really understand the why. Uh, and that's, you know, our, our quantitative data has, you know, huge numbers in it or large numbers, yeah. as, as large as we can get. And the data is as representative as we can get. We really are very concerned about that. In usability testing, it's not so uh, much of a requirement to make sure that your participants are truly representative of the population because you're looking for pain points and you're trying to understand the why it is that people have these problems so that you understand their mental model and you avoid avo uh, designing in that way again. Yeah, yeah. I know one criticism of usability testing, especially like we say sometimes the sweet spot is between five and eight people. Right. Is that enough like to really uh, f solve the problems you're, you're trying to solve or is it not usability testing is not really like that? It's like, it's like it's, you're not comparing it to um, say like surveys where you're doing 100 people that like usability tests about yeah. specific pain points. That's exactly right. So um, in surveys, you have to be really sure that you're getting as good a, as a sample as you can, as, as representative as you can of the population that's of interest to you. Yeah. And there's various sampling techniques to do that correctly. Otherwise, there's going to be problems with your survey, as we've often seen in voting and polling and yeah, that yeah. kind of thing. Um, with usability testing, we're doing something else quite quite different really. We're using usability testing to understand what problems people have with the design as they go through, as they try and complete their task. Um, and so what happens is uh, often you see, you start seeing the same problems again and again, and you really learn that, you know, oh, this is kind of a problem from everyone. In fact, there can be problems that you see right at the beginning of running your studies, say after even one or two people, and you're like, yes, of course, you know, I should have seen that. Of course, people think of it in that way. And of course, they're dropping off at this point. Um, you don't need many, many people to prove that. Um, and so you tend to find after five or eight, then you've seen the majority of the problems. If you, you've probably seen 80% of the problems. If you carry on testing, you will see more problems over time, but you'll have caught all the main ones in the first five to eight, and it will be definitely diminishing returns on that. So say I'm designing a product. Um, is there a point where I'll pivot in the research? So like, say we've done two tests on an app or website, these really obvious problems, the UI is not obvious or whatever comes up. Do you stop and say, right, we're gonna adjust the UI and the, the, the design thing and carry on testing again? Or does that muddy the waters? I mean, is it okay to do that? Yeah, no, it's totally okay to do that. And that's actually a form of testing called right usability testing. And uh, there we schedule two or three people to come in and then we have a break, uh, like half a day or a day where the team get together and talk about what they've seen and how they can adjust it. And then you'll get two, two three more people come in uh, and do the same again and, and iterate on it. And it's, it's a great idea really because you don't really want to or need to see kind of five, six users all, you know, fall into the same problem. If yeah. you all agree as a team that that problem exists and needs fixing. There are other problems where, you know, you're not sure. Somebody, somebody, you know, goes one way and somebody else goes another. And it's really, you, there might be a few different mental models out there and mm. you kind of have to see how it goes over time mm -hmm. to see uh, what, what the main issues are and what your team feels need fixing. But certainly, um, there's another good reason to do it as well, that those obvious ones that you really want to fix might be 
sort of hiding other problems yeah. that wouldn't be exposed if you didn't fix those ones during the course of the flow. Okay, the other thing, um, I remember you you did the research project called the 25 Principles of App Design, yeah, right. sometimes known as the Gove Principle. <laughs> <laughs> web, web first, we did web and then we did app and we did a whole set on retail. And I remember speaking with you, it's like, uh, it's almost like a, my mind just was blown when you talked about you do a pre-study before the study to test to see whether the study's actually good. I mean, that kind of like, of course you do. Um, could you explain a bit about like, what um, is it called a pre-study or pilot study? Right, it's called pilot study. And so for usability testing, we, um, yeah, exactly like you say, we're testing the test. We want to make sure that um, the different tasks that we ask people are sort of lining up properly and make sense for them. Uh, we want to make sure that those flows work as we think we should at the time in, in the product. Um, it's absolutely crucial to do pilot testing beforehand. Yeah, and you can do that with all techniques of user research. So there are many techniques that we haven't also talked about. Uh, diary studies are something that's sometimes done. We can test the questions that we're asking people in the diary study. Even surveys, it's important to test your survey instrument out first. And we often do what we call cognitive pre-testing, which mm. we'll sit down with someone and go through the questions and make sure the questions mean to them what we think they mean. Yeah, um, so just even going back to the beginning, so you want to test, you've done some tests with your family. What's the next thing? I mean, is there, do you really at that point need to get a good researcher to help you plan these things? Or is there something that small teams and startups can do now, like professionally to test their, yeah. their products? Um, well, there's absolutely, you can do it. Google Ventures puts out some good um, guides for doing usability testing and different sorts of user research testing. So that's a good place to look for how to do this from a startup perspective. Uh, you know, as a user researcher, I personally don't think companies uh, hire user researchers early enough. In order to get that kind of foundational research done and really understand the space, really need to be thinking about doing that higher earlier than we're doing it now. What tends to happen in companies is that people hire, eventually they realize that they can't do design without a designer. Yeah. So they hire a designer and then the designer says, well, I, it's hard for me to do design without the research findings and to really understand the context I'm working in. So that's the kind of like pattern it tends to happen in. It would be nice from my perspective if it weren't the other way around. But that's not to say that, you know, people shouldn't be doing user testing themselves. Obviously, you can get better. It's not particularly advocated that you should work with family and friends. It's just a good way to get started. And you will find issues with your product. But um, it's better to uh, try, although you're not aiming for in five to eight people, a representative sample of the population, you do want to try and get the same sort of people that you that are uh, you you're aiming your product for. So if you're creating a, a music app for teenagers, then it would be great to test on teenagers yeah. that are, that are the sort of target users for your product. It's, it's also important to test for demographic as well. Like in terms of the way users will behave in India will be very different to the way they behave in America, right? Right. And, is and they're under different sort of constraints and different different contexts and different conditions with you know the kinds of phones they use, um, the different. Um, connectivity they have, all those kind of things. Cultural things, which may those be like how they respond to UI and whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And how, is, there, is it just basically you need to get out in the field? I mean, I think one thing people do is they test too much in front of their computer and their, their you know, amazing MacBook or a, a amazing Wi-Fi connection. But like, how do you really empathize? Because I think research is more about empathizing with the person you're trying to design for, right? Right, absolutely. And so I think, you know, we need to take account of the technological constraints that we just talked about, you know, making sure that we're, if we're aiming for those kind of markets that we're potentially, I know in India, we have a lot better connectivity nowadays, but in certain parts of the world, there's a lot of the world that's still on 2G connections. So taking those kind of considerations into account is important, but also you're right, the, the, the cultural and different contextual factors can be really important. So what if you're testing for um, users' preferences over two designs? So if you've got two separate things, how do you know you're testing for the right things or the person's opinion and what, they, what preferences they have? Yeah, that's a really tricky one. I think that, you know, I'm not greatly in favor of testing, uh, using usability testing for preferences because it's such a small sample. Potentially the sample might be biased. If you asked with eight different people, you might come up with different preferences, especially if you were just adding up the numbers. I'm really not in favor of that because it has those problems, you know, usability testing isn't really for that purpose. So I'm not uh, against 
asking about preferences in order to understand why people have those preferences. I think that can be really useful in usability studies. Yeah. So understanding, you know, that they need particular things, say in maps when they're navigating, they need particular landmarks. Yeah. That's really, really interesting. But, you know, just like trying to collect raw numbers about they preferred design A rather than design well, like B. They preferred blue to red. I mean, is that... And people lie, right? When you ask them questions, right. they might tell you what you they think you want to know. Absolutely. So this is why I'm much more into like understanding them completing a task and understanding like what works for them and what doesn't work for them about completing that task. It's really all about getting that deeper understanding in yeah. usability studies. So yeah, don't add up the numbers for preferences, like, but use that um, to understand why the particular design is preferred over another one or, and what we can do for future designs to make it more useful for people. And just really understand the context rather than the personal opinion of yes, well. That's right. Yeah, that's right. And understanding why their context leads to that view. I try as much as possible to avoid black magic. And like whenever I'm reviewing any code that any of the designers on my team are writing, we like try and avoid anything that's Maybe it's a little hack and it makes it slightly more performant, but the truth is like, if we want to evolve the material design system, we need to be able to build on top of the code and each layer of that code matters. 